Good evening in Yoknam, Bokatov in Yosemite. And for the first time, let me say shalom to all our friends in Odessa and throughout Ukraine. Well, we had not intended to have this episode today, uh, midweek, uh, but we do what Israelis and Americans as friends and allies do when we have to, we mobilize. And there's no better mobilizer in the game of humanitarian assistance than Israel, uh, Israel's leading humanitarian uh, organization and uh, the, the largest uh, in Israel, but still punching above its weight because whenever crisis hits, whether it's wildfires in California, floods or hurricanes in the Western hemisphere, refugee crises uh, from Syria and, and Lesbos, um, and as we learned just only a couple of weeks ago with the current Afghan refugee crisis, Israel aid has people on the ground. Israel aid is uh, helping people, not asking them who they are, what their religion is, what their backgrounds are, merely how do you help someone who's a refugee in crisis, who's escaping a, a natural, or in this case, a uh, political and man-made disaster. Um, this is indeed a disaster. Uh, our attention is focused in a way that perhaps I can really uh, not think of any precedent in recent times. For those of you that either have friends or family or memories or just a prayer that you want to share for the people of Ukraine at this moment of crisis, please feel free to put something in the chat. We're here today uh, to learn about what's being done in a remarkable way, in a remarkable period of time by our friends uh, uh, who are on the ground. You're going to hear uh, not directly from uh, Ukraine in uh, harm's way directly, but nearby in the border uh, country of Moldova. And you'll learn about why Moldova uh, specifically uh, as a, a choice for Israel aid to provide their unique kind of assistance. And we're grateful today to have this program in large measure because of the leadership of uh, 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 one individual and the teams he's working with in two different organizations, America Israel Friendship League and Israel Aid, the president of America Israel Friendship League, Jonathan Barsadeh, who also is a board member of Israel Aid and knew immediately with a crisis like this, uh, we needed to mobilize to allow people to uh, hear the story live understand it with its many nuances. So let me turn over to Jonathan to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining from. Um, I, I would say that I'm happy to greet everyone, but uh, but honestly, this is one of those events that I wish we didn't, didn't have to do. And actually, before we start, I would just like to take a few seconds for us just to to, to close our eyes and just think for a moment and remember those that are basically the victims of what's been happening this, this last day, couple of weeks. Thank you, thank you. Last two years of the pandemic have really, they've taught us what a dichotomy of a species we humans are. I mean, we see on the one hand, the value of compassion, the value of life, how fragile it is. And, and yet these last two weeks, we've also been witnessing the inhumanity of self-inflicted pain and suffering. And as a human race, we know how it is to turn on each other, but yet thankfully, we also know how great we are in helping and supporting each other. Since soon after it's established, Israel as a country has been the symbol, not only of its ability to defend itself, but also to showing compassion and generosity towards those in need, not only in Israel, but in the, around the world. And it did so oftentimes without recognition, simply because it was the right thing to do. In the last dec decade, Israel, an Israeli organization, has been following in these steps and has been taking Israeli know-how, Israeli expertise, and above all, Israeli compassion for fellow human beings 
to help those in need of our They do so oftentimes also without public recognition in countries like Syria, Afghanistan, and many other countries that they do so have to do so in secret because of how Israel is perceived in those countries. And they do so again, because it's the right thing to do. As Wayne indicated, I'm proud, not only because IFL is, AFL has been bringing out these stories of Israel and Israelis for people in the United States and around the world to become aware and familiar of some of the wonderful things that come from Israel and so the positive impact that Israel has on the world we live in, but also because I am a proud member of it. I'm a member of the board of directors and hoping that through my activities through that board, I'm also helping small dent out, helping people out there in their time. I'd like to thank everyone for really making the efforts of joining us today to tell the story of Israel's efforts, support and their support efforts over on the border of Ukraine and Moldova. This is a story that once again brings together Israeli know-how and innovation. And once again demonstrates Israeli tenacity and on the start on the spot improvisation. I recall how within a couple of days of the breakout of the hostilities, while the board, while the world was still staring with disbelief at what's happening, Israel didn't stop and didn't wonder, but actually within a couple of days, its first group uh, was sent out to determine where and how it could be of help. And we'll hear today from that team, how they've been braving the conditions to help those who are oftentimes forgotten and are the innocent victims of these tragic events. From the devastations of earthquakes, pandemics, and war around the world, from Japan, Asia, Central America, and Europe, Israel has seen it all. And at the helm of this organization is a true humanitarian that I'm really proud to be able to call not only my colleague, but also my friend, the CEO of Israel, Yatam Kolitzel. Yatam, screen is all yours. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's so great to have you as a friend, as a partner, as a board member. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, um, America Israel Friendship League, such a great partner. And, and, and thank you for mobilizing so quickly um, and helping us set up this important webinar on, on this such important and urgent topic. So I've been in this field for 14 years now, and I've been to quite a few crises, uh, most recently the Afghan refugee crisis, but previously I also um, led some of our team with the Syrian refugees in the tsunami in Japan, the earthquake in Nepal, um, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, and, and Israel has been around for 20 years, but really what we're seeing right now in the Ukraine and in, in the surrounding countries is of a different scale, um, just in terms of the numbers more than 2 million people fled the country in less than two weeks. It is unprecedented in the last 80 years. Um, when this crisis broke, actually before, when kind of the political tension uh, was on the rise, um, we um, were preparing our emergency response team for the possibility that we may have to deploy. Obviously, we have to take under consideration security and safety issues. Um, but literally two hours after the invasion, we got together with our board and with our um, senior management and emergency response team, and we decided to deploy. And, and then we, we realized that um, there are so many, that there are five neighboring countries on the West. You have Poland, you have Romania, Hungary, and Slovakia, and Moldova. And very quickly, we decided to focus our first effort, at least, on Moldova, because it's the country that has the least capacity to, um, to deal with this crisis. It's one of the poorest countries in Europe. Um, and we actually received an official request for support from the Moldovan government, um, who, who asked us to, to take a leading role um, in supporting the Ukrainian refugees in Moldova. So in less than 48 hours, uh, we had a team that deployed to the Ukrainian border from Israel, our emergency response team. Um, when we reached there, when the team reached there and you hear from the team on the ground in, 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 in just a couple of minutes, 
But when the team reached there, we realized we were pretty early and we did not yet see the, the huge influx. It was just starting. But very quickly, we've seen an, an unbelievable, unprecedented influx of refugees. Um, and and um, very soon you'll hear what, how, how we responded. But the other thing I want to um, relate to is that, again, unfortunately, we have a lot of experience. I can't say in a similar situation, but in other refugee crises around the world, whether it's the refugee crisis in South Sudan, Kenya, and Uganda, whether it's the Venezuelan refugee crisis in Colombia, um, the Afghan refugee crisis, um, and obviously the Syrian refugee crisis. And last December, we concluded a six years operation of support for Syrian refugees that was focused on Greece. And, and when we think about the situation in the Ukraine, that's how Israel is thinking about it. It's not only important to be there now and provide immediate relief, which we are doing um, in a, in a very, on a pretty massive scale, it's even more important for us to be there uh, in the long run and support the recovery, the mental health, the trauma uh, of the Ukrainian people. And even if we think of the best case scenario that somehow most of the people will be able to go back to their homes, even in their homes in, their, in, in the Ukraine, they will need a lot of support and recovery. So while we have a big team on the ground doing incredible work already, we're also thinking on the long run, on the long term, and, and, and the long-term needs. And I think um, as um, Jonathan mentioned uh, and Wayne mentioned, I, I in, in, in my 14 years of work have not seen uh, such an incredible uh, response from um, donors, media um, in Israel. We've seen so many uh, people stepping in to volunteer or to send supplies or to send donations. It's all really moving and heartwarming. Um, and it's amazing. I just hope that this support will not just be short term, but uh, because these people will need our long term support in the years to come. And that's exactly what Israel is planning to do. So with that, I'll pass it back to uh, you, Wayne, um, and then we'll hear from our team on the ground that's really doing incredible work. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yo, Tom, and um, um, for your empowerment of your, your team. and. Um, uh, not just to be there, but to be uh, impactful uh, in, 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 in ways that their presence really makes uh, the world of difference. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce um, uh, first uh, Chagit um, Krakow Chernai, uh, who uh, was somewhere else in Europe uh, uh, just prior to this and then when she got the call uh, and very quickly had to... Um, uh, go to apply. I don't know if you've been to Moldova before. Uh, I suspect a lot of people uh, uh, in our audience uh, would uh, have some difficulty finding it on a map. Uh, but as as uh, we just heard from Yotam, it was a, a real strategic decision to be in Moldova. Um, Chagid, I know you've been uh, you've led other long term missions uh, in Greece, in Fiji, in Italy. Uh, what were your first impressions when you arrived in Moldova? Um, what did you have to first do to make yourself operational? Obviously the number of refugees uh, maybe initially was small, it's now no longer small. Uh, uh, and we're gonna see some images from uh, your team members who have uh, been able to document that. Uh, but take us to your very first days upon arrival and what you had to do as head of mission to organize uh, uh, for your for the rest of your team. Right, thank you. Um, so like Tom said, we were really one of the first organizations to come, which gave us an opportunity to really evaluate the situation and assess the needs and the gaps that the government has. Um, I think it's really unique that the government here of uh, Moldova is very uh, motivated to work and to support not only the situation, but also work with the organizations to make sure that we can provide the best response possible, not only for the short term, but like Yotam said, for the very long term. Um, Moldova had over 250,000 refugees come through and is now hosting more than 100,000 refugees. Um, 
the statistics that we've got, and we need to remember that this is a very, very small country. This is a country that has only two and a half million people. So the magnitude of this whole situation and influx in this country is, is great, is huge. So uh, while, while many organizations, which is important, are focusing in areas like Poland, I think uh, the reason why we're here is because we need to give response in areas that sometimes get less of the focus. Uh, but in terms of what the needs are, this is where we need to be right now. Um, one, just to kind of understand, one in every eight children today in Moldova is a Ukraine refugee. So that's just kind of the amount, first of all, of children, a vulnerable population that is arriving into the country, and now the country needs to accommodate. So many of these refugees, not only that we're meeting highly vulnerable of them, women and children, but we're meeting also a lot of minorities that are coming from the Ukraine. And these minorities, this kind of population, they don't have the support or they don't have the funds or they don't even have the documents to continue to other countries. And while Moldova is doing the absolute best to provide support, shelters, protection, um, the situation here, as you can imagine, is, is, is highly at risk and it's going to be like this for a very long time. So just to kind of answer your question, we're working with the government. It was very important for us on the very first day, not only to supply, you know, the communities with urgent relief the minute that we got here, because that's what you need to do, but to also partner with the civic society organizations, with the NGOs and with the government to make sure that they know that we're here for the long run, to work with, in partnership with them and to establish as much uh, mechanisms in place. And we see every day things are changing. Every day we're reevaluating the situation. Um, and these crises, you know, they tend to create additional layers and additional levels of crises within. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how everything started, with, really with creating that partnership and not only creating this kind of movement of emergency uh, relief items, but also really building off the relationships and creating ready now programs that can support the existing structures of the shelters in the cities and the borders. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that point that you raised that uh, your work is very dependent and I think um, all humanitarian assistance is, is actually collaborating with uh, your, your hosts in a, in, in a sense. And um, I know we're gonna see some of the images in a moment uh, from the, the, uh, uh, the, your arrival and the places that you're working, but who were you working with in setting that up? Who are some of the organizations? Were they government? Were they churches? Were they other NGOs? Is the Red Cross there? Who, who are some of the organizations and in particular the Moldovan uh, 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 organizations or groups that, that you've developed relations with and, and, and are working with now? Right, so uh, we're, we're working first of all with the Ministry of Health. Uh, we're working with the WHO. Uh, we're mobilizing now medical teams as well and we're working a lot in the area of protection and providing psychosocial support for the trauma that we see within the children, within the hosting community itself, within the parents as well, the groups of minorities. We're working with different local organizations, such as Keystone. We're working with an organization called People in Need. We're really kind of uh, spreading out. Uh, we're working here also with the municipalities that have kind of um, um, an additional system to the governments. So we're working both with governmental shelters and we're working also with municipality shelters that are giving different kinds of uh, support and different kinds of mechanisms. We're working with the Ministry of Social Protection. Um, we're starting now to establish a relationship with the Ministry of Education. So, yeah. Great, okay, so I think we're gonna go now uh, take a look at, uh, get a little bit of an overview visually of the place that you're operating in. Uh, anything in particular, Hagit, you wanna share about uh, the, the, the video before, before we show it? Um, I think the videos really kind of give us an opportunity to a little bit visualize, you know, um, it's, it's um, you read about the situation, you understand how severe it is, but I think once you, see the pictures, you can a little bit kind of, you know, 
smell and have a sense of how urgent and how difficult the situation really is. So yeah, I, I hope that kind of goes through a bit. Great. We're here in Palanka in uh, the far southeast of Moldova on the border with Ukraine, only 50 kilometers from Odessa, which is Ukraine's largest port city. Around 20,000 people are crossing the border here every day. Israel's been here since day four of the conflict. And what we're doing is providing immediate support to particularly mothers and, and young children who, when they arrive here, they don't know what they're doing. They don't necessarily know where they're going. Israel, together with local volunteers and local organizations in the municipality here, have set up a tent to provide a safe space, really, for mothers and young children, especially a place with activities, a place for mothers to change diapers, where they can also uh, receive immediate support and figure out what's happening. That really just that first kind of human connection uh, once they've crossed the border and once, once they've made it to this kind of foreign country in this situation that they didn't ever think that they would be in before. Once they get here, they then go in buses to shelters across Moldova, especially in Chisinau, the capital, where Israel is working in the shelters to provide child-friendly spaces in what's often a hectic, difficult, scary environment, places for children to um, they kind of be sheltered from the chaos and the, and the, the difficult situation and the, and the um, stress where they can actually just be kids um, for the first time in days, which is so important in that um, those first few days when they haven't even had a chance to rest and they've been traveling such a long way and they still don't know where they're going. Israel's going to be here for the long term. Um, we understand that the, the impact of the situation here in Moldova is huge, and the impact of the situation for the Ukrainian communities who have left is huge. And even when the war is over, the, the ramifications of the situation will go on and on, the really human ramifications. Moldova is a, a small country. It's only got two, about two and a half million people, and they've already, um, as of today, taken in more than 230,000 people from Ukraine with more than 100,000 staying, and it's not going away, and neither are we. Well, that was really, um, I feel like that was like the calm before the storm, literally. And uh, we got a chance to uh, uh, talk with Tamar yesterday, late last night after a long day. And then I know you're traveling uh, long distances with the border. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, we have the benefit of having um, Tamar Lazarus uh, with us. She's the Director of Development and Communications for Israel. She's a veteran of, of some 10 years working with Israeli nonprofits. She's been on missions with Israel aid uh, literally around the globe in Uganda and Greece, Albania. Um, and now here you are in Moldova. And um, I wonder if you can uh, share with us a little bit about you know, the setup. I know we have uh, some pictures that we can share. Can you tell us a little bit of what had to be constructed in order for you to be able to function now um, and uh, give us a little bit of an orientation of where you are in terms of where the refugees are and then the continuing work you're doing with them in terms of uh, resettlement and, and uh, uh, receiving them. Sure, uh, thank you for having us. Um, so our focus at the moment has really been divided into two main areas. Um, the first is at Palanka, which is, which is the border with Ukraine. Uh, which is where the main influx of refugees from Ukraine are coming from in Moldova. And then the other focus of our work is really in the in the city, in the center, where in the shelters, uh, where those that are not don't have a place to move on to immediately, um, and those that just need to stop and gather themselves um, are stopping temporarily. So to give you to give you a sense, and you're you're seeing some of the images, uh, the scene at the border is incredibly, incredibly challenging incredibly distressing. Uh, we're seeing hordes of people coming through. Uh, majority are mothers with children, since the majority of the men have stayed behind in Ukraine to fight. Um, we're seeing people come in treacherous weather conditions, uh, snowstorms, uh, 
water flooding, uh, the incredibly muddy, uh, incredibly, incredibly muddy uh, scenes. Um, people are literally coming, holding one bag with all their belongings in it, holding their children and their bags. Um, many are literally on their own uh, with really, some really have no idea where they're going next. Um, so what we in, immediately identified um, is that the people, when they come through the border, essentially what happens is they sort of wait at the border uh, for buses to different destinations. Um, but they just need a minute to stop and to gather themselves and honestly to just be in a warm, safe environment. So our team initially built uh, a large tent, um, decked it out as you saw in the pictures. Um, so it would be a warm, safe space mainly for mothers and children to stop a uh, place to change uh, diapers, um, to be able to feed babies, just really to have a place of respite. It really is just a, a very special space. Um, and so that was really, really critical. Um, and we have, we've trained local volunteers who are kind of staffing that tent and under a kind of the supervision of some of our social workers. And just to make sure we really support people at that exact moment where literally as they cross the border, they have become refugees. And that's a, a very, very poignant uh, and difficult moment. Um, so that's, I would say that's kind of the main place that we are at the border. Um, and we're seeing still the influx is ongoing. It's constant, um, it's through the day, it's through the night. It really doesn't stop. Um, so that's kind of one area of focus. And then what we're finding is some people, you know, have somewhere to go and they continue on to other countries in Europe and others really don't. And others, some really just need to stop and breathe. Um, so many are finding themselves in the, in the shelters here in the city. Um, and that's like the secondary place that we've really wanted to focus because you have a huge mass of people. Many of the people in the shelters are from minority groups within the Ukraine. So we have a lot from the Roma community, from Azerbaijan, from Georgia, a real mix. Um, and there are often people that really don't have a next destination. Um, and so they need to stop and breathe and think. Um, so we're really trying to focus. Um, and these shelters have been put together very, very quickly um, by government authorities, by the municipalities, and they've done an amazing job to so quickly respond. Um, but these are difficult places. We're identifying a lot of protection issues um, a lot of challenges when you suddenly put a lot of people together in one space. Um, you'll see from, I think you saw from some of the images, uh, there's issues with privacy. Um, there's a lot of things that we're concerned about. So we really, really wanted to focus with all of our expertise um, from many years of work on, on protection issues and post-trauma and everything that relates to uh, the protection of children uh, to really make sure that we can do everything we can uh, to ensure that those that are in these really distressing situations have as much professional support as they need. Well, it, it's great to see the two of you in your Israel Aid t-shirts and uh, uh, calm, relaxed, and um, relatively comfortable, but I know that that's not the conditions that you're um, working in uh, uh, during long uh, days and evenings. So maybe we can take a, a quick look at this second uh, video, I believe is just from the past day or two, the past 24 hours. Um, and uh, now that you have your, your setup and your infrastructure, as you uh, mentioned, the refugees are not on a specific schedule. They're arriving when they arrive, their buses are coming through, and, and I guess this is just a constant uh, um, uh, way station, in, in a sense, as you were describing, with some moving on and some literally having no idea uh, what it, what is next or, or even processing what it means, the fact that they're a refugee now. Hi, so we're standing here uh, in Palanka on the border in Moldova with Ukraine. Uh, this is the place where thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees from Ukraine uh, are coming into Moldova. Um, behind us is the tent that's been put up by Israel Aid. Here we're providing a safe, warm space, uh, specifically for mothers and children. Um, you can see the conditions are really, really, really challenging. It's freezing cold uh, and it's an exceptionally difficult place. So it's a space where they can be. We have resilience kits. Um, we have volunteers.
volunteers from local partnerships, local partners, um, and we have also um, our social worker as well who's able to provide a little bit of respite um, while the refugees that are here wait to move on. So I think uh, the, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words there. Um, uh, so just remind us in terms of orientation from that sort of border spot to where your administrative offices are, what's, what's the distance and um, how much traveling are you doing, you know, just on, on, on a regular basis now? How does that, that piece work? Yeah, it's about, it's about two and a half hours drive um, from Kishinev, which is the center. Um, from Palanka, so we're kind of our teams, we're really focusing on kind of moving back and forwards to make sure that we're in all the spaces we need. I think one of the main things that kind of also adds to that kind of scene, which I, I didn't mention before, but I really think is critical, is that you have to remember in this context, families have been torn apart and everyone that's coming and not just dealing with that distress and then the kind of transport, they've, they've left their fathers and brothers and husbands behind. So it really you know, extend. So now the onward journey, now even if it's two and a half hours or or days, wherever they're going, that onward journey is even more, even more complicated by by that by that factor. All right. Well, we're getting a, a ton of questions coming in from um, uh, our viewers today. So let me just jump into uh, uh, the the first of those. Yvonne is asking uh, about the the Israel aid presence itself. So Chagit, what, who is your team? What are the things that they're doing? I know each mission has sort of unique needs, but on, on the other hand, um, there are some uh, repetitive sort of uh, 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 needs that come into play. So tell us a little about your team and what they do. Okay, so we have um, a team of experts, um, professionals who have expertise in psychotherapy, um, in the post-traumatic stress with children. Um, we have a team that uh, have experience with early childhood protection issues. We have medical staff that can provide the, the mobile medic care in the different locations that we're at. Um, and uh, we have some logistics with us as well, um, some local staff that we're working with. Um, and uh, all our staff of the experts speak the language as well, which is really important. Um, and more, more staff are coming in, um, more hiring of staff uh, here in Moldova. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work. I mean, I, I think maybe just to kind of uh, help uh, give a better image of what we're dealing with here is only in the city here of Chisinau, there are almost 50 centers, uh, 50 centers that provide shelter for the refugees. Um, we are working now in several of them. We're working in a really large shelter that uh, has 800 refugees in it at a time. So when you leave the shelter at night, you see an influx of more refugees coming in. Um, so the situation is very hectic. Uh, we're working also with all the authorities on capacity building programs to support kind of the first responders here in Moldova to have more of the the skills and the know-how of how to work with such a vulnerable situation and a very kind of crisis uh, point in time we're also working to support the coordination of the shelters as well and how do you build a structure to really kind of be as user-friendly possible for for this population uh, we're seeing now also the changes within the shelters uh, the government is understanding that they have to separate women and children from the rest of the population. So that's kind of a, another layer of the crisis that we're now um, involved in. How do you work around all the protection issues that come and rise when you have large amount of people who are scared, who don't know each other, who are from different areas around the world, different rights uh, in just one place. So, uh, so we're seeing a lot of problems, uh, very severe problems there. So we're working also on a referral mechanism with the government as well to try and see how to unify and, and work together in correlation with all the different support mechanisms within the country. Tamar, we have um, several questions about common language. Um, uh, you, in any refugee situation, you're going to have multiple languages of a host country and, and uh, the, the uh, native tongue of, of, of the refugees themselves. 
in this uh, in in your setup, um, and actually Eugene is also asking about uh, the administrative needs. What language is that done in, as opposed to the language that you're receiving the refugees and uh, uh, greeting them, working with them, uh, sharing these resilience packages? Uh, so tell us a little bit about um, what it sounds like. What 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 are the the the, lang the languages of this refugee camp and this refugee resettlement uh, uh, situation. So we're seeing a mix because I said, as I said, there's a lot of minority groups as well. But I would say the main the main languages, the ones we're really making sure that our staff and our team that come out have, um, is Russian primarily. Um, then we have Ukrainian, Romanian also relevant. Um, for us, it's absolutely critical to make sure that our staff have the, the right languages. And that's why our, our team back at headquarters is really working around the clock to, to really recruit uh, not just amazing professionals who have experience in all the, 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 um, in all the places that Hagit mentioned, but specifically will be able to communicate um, because the most important thing for people that have been through this type of experience is that they're able to communicate and, and share and talk and discuss. Um, and process. So at the same time, while our, our psychosocial and protection and, and sort of mental health experts were, were kind of working behind the scenes, we were, they were making sure that everything was translated. So all of our resilience kits um, were immediately translated uh, into the various languages so that they could be shared and understood and digested immediately. Um, and that's really important for us. And so we're working with translators also as needed and also, as, it, as Khayyip mentioned, and it's just kind of how Israel works, is that for us, it's so important to recruit local staff and to really build a team of um, local people uh, as well as local volunteers, um, because that's such a critical part of kind of understanding all the different cultural needs. Um, so, yeah, language is, is absolutely critical, and that's why we're making sure that, that all our experts that continue to come you know, from Israel will have, will have the relevant languages. Well, the images that we're watching now that I know your your team has has captured are, are themselves just so gripping and uh, um, speak to the uh, enormity of the situation, but from the perspective of individuals. Um, we've had several questions about um, uh, mental health and um, which is I know we're recurring challenge in a, a refugee situation or anyone going through uh, trauma. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of the areas where Israel has a lot of experience. Um, I say unfortunately, just because it's uh, uh, accompanies, it seems, all of your missions. Um, Chagit, can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing here? Um, obviously, we know there's a situation where uh, many of the uh, men are, are, are staying in Ukraine, and so women and children are arriving on their own in, in some cases. Um, have you identified any uh, 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 new, um, are, are you seeing specific uh, challenges on the mental health front that, that you're finding that you need to deal with uh, uh, immediately, and, and what are those resources that you're able to provide? Right. Yeah. So um, for sure, I think it's something that you you see and you feel the second that you uh, meet the refugees right on the border. Um, some of them have been walking for for miles to just reach. Um, some of them, you know, have just been freezing cold. Um, it's not only being cold, but also being wet. It's been raining. Um, it's very, very difficult to keep yourself warm. So I think from from a mental and from a physical point of view, you're seeing people who are very confused, who a day ago had, you know, their own homes, had their own jobs, had their their schools, their kindergartens, and suddenly in one minute they're this refugees and they're part of this uh, crisis. And and you know everyone wants to support, but many people don't know how. And uh, suddenly they're in the center of this chaotic situation. Um, I feel that you see brave, incredible women who are carrying their kids literally on them to safety, who are so, so scared out of their minds of what's going to be tomorrow, of what they're going to eat, of how they're going to even change their clothes or maybe take maybe 
a decent shower of what happens if their child is now sick, of what happens if someone is now, if someone is now, you know, having a, a difficult situation within the shelter at night, who do they turn to? Where do they put their children? When do they have a chance to breathe and feel, you know, that they can have the resilience to keep this support going and this, you know, strength for their kids? We met, um, a woman yesterday and we were talking with her about the different options that she has and we were showing her the child-friendly space area that we've built in one of these large shelters um and then the the her kid i think i think she was like a five-year-old was like nudging on her like like mommy mommy i want to ask you something and she said what and she said when are we going home mm. and you saw the mother like very uh, in an incredible way like explaining don't worry it will be soon we're together you, you know we're each other's home and the second the kid turns back to the child-friendly space, the mother turns to us and, you know, just breaks down in tears. Um, so the situation is very fragile. And that's why we're trying to really try and maintain a focus on, on building the resilience and making sure that the referral mechanism is at spot, supporting the local responders, supporting the local professionals, providing them with tools, and just really making sure that, you know, that we're kind of evaluating the situation and that we're here together with them for the long term to to support as much as we can. So let's move a little bit then from the uh, uh, the, the mental health challenges with which obviously are 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 going to be ongoing and and um, um, uh, and and have to be continuously monitored. Uh, you mentioned, Tamar, these resilience kits. Um, I'm assuming that's more like provisions and actual uh, things that you need just when you arrive. Can What's in a resilience kit? And uh, we have, uh, Elaine is asking, who's feeding all these people? Um, so tell us a little bit about the sustenance issues, just from a basic um, keeping people, uh, you know, um, um, fed and, and, and healthy, you know, upon arrival. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it really is an exceptionally challenging situation in that sense. Um, I would say in terms of us, when people cross the border, there's amazing local Moldovan community who are there with, you know, warm food that they're literally handing people as they arrive. Um, and actually, sometimes it's those moments of kindness that really, you know, catch you when you've had such a difficult journey. Um, and that's also a time when we kind of in the tent are ready also to provide these resilience kits. Uh, the kits are really focused on really supporting the children to channel positively um, the stress and trauma that they're experiencing, um, that they're, you know, really to help them because their parents are also in an incredibly, obviously stressful situation. So it includes a lot of different kind of calming um, techniques. We give a full instruction to parents that our social workers talk through with each of the parents, how they can best support their children in this very, very difficult situation. So it includes, you know, everything from a stress ball that the, the kids and you see them, they, they rip it out and everyone's squeezing and it helps sort of to um, slow their breathing down just to kind of calm. Um, lots of everything from mandalas to color in, Things that sound very basic, I think, to, to you and me and maybe the people listening, but it's it's these basic things that really, um, really help uh, process this very, very traumatic time. So we make sure also that all of our information is including the kit, included in the kit. So if anyone, you know, feels they need to speak to social workers, etc., we do have people there kind of to explain. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really basic thing, but uh, it's really important. It's a really important tool. Uh, and it also allows our staff to engage with families. It's a, it's a talking point. It's a place to sort of start to kind of understand the needs. And it's often through the kind of sharing of the resilience kits that we understand, we find out the stories um, and we understand, you know, what exactly the situations are. So, you know, yesterday in the tent, uh, one of the women was explaining to us as we were kind of handing her the kit that she literally has nowhere to go. She has nowhere to go. She has a child with her. Her husband's back in the Ukraine. Um, and she actually can't think straight of, of, of just where will be her next stop. Um, so using these kind of methods as a way to kind of access and build relationships is, is a really critical tool for, for our experts. Um, we had an interesting question from Karen that I hadn't really thought about. Um, 
are any of the refugees arriving with pets? And is the camp, how does, is the camp situated uh, uh, to accommodate that in some way? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I think we, we, but we've all, all the team has been um, really struck uh, actually by that. Um, so many people are crossing the border um, with animals, uh, with their dogs. Um, in our tent yesterday, there was a number of uh, little hamster cages, um, you know, where people had brought. And it's just that moment of understanding that when you're about to leave everything, uh, what do you take with you? Uh, Hagit Mitzan, well, maybe you want to share the story about uh, the guy that came, <laughs> what he had in his bag. I'll let you, I'll let you explain. Yeah, yeah, you know, we were talking with the different families and um, um, just you know, asking, so so, what do you choose to bring with you? Because each one really literally can bring only one bag with them. And and really this uh, one guy opens up his bag, that's all he has with him. And he takes out a box and in the box he has his hamster. Um, <laughs> and I think that, I don't know, it kind of, you know, um, it touches you because you 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 never think about that. If, if I have to, if I have to leave, now my house without thinking what do I take that's like most uh, precious to me um, and and the animals yeah it's um it's a very it's a very touching issue and, and it also creates its own you know uh, challenges so one of the shelters that we're working with has a challenge because some children have allergies so how do you kind of you know support both populations that need a, a help families that come with their animals that are part of who they are and then children who are also um, allergic to it and everyone's kind of, you know, stuck together. So it's an, another point of, um, of uh, interesting interaction. So uh, Tamara, I think I saw in one of those pictures, uh, e even though you were wearing a mask, uh, you were playing with some children and I could actually see your smile uh, even though you were wearing a mask. So two questions, one, um, uh, uh, what are the COVID protections uh, um, people are asking about? How, how do you and your, your, your team protect themselves in um, this unprecedented period of trying to do humanitarian work while there's an entire uh, you know, health crisis uh, to deal with as well? And secondly, how do you see the kids um, uh, it, it, it looks like you've really built uh, a, a space for the kids to be kids in addition with the, uh, the paintings and the, the gymnastics the kids are doing and the games and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about what it looks like to build a piece of specifically for children in this setting? Yeah, I want to I want to talk actually about the paintings. It's, it's important that you mention that because um, Every day the kids do their drawings um, and the team there make sure that they write their names. And it's very important that they write their names um, because it's, it's theirs and it's to try and really give us a, a sense that this is their space. And then on the first day they put, you know, all the, all the pictures on the wall. Um, and when they came back in the morning, everything had gone and it had all been kind of torn off the wall. And then the second day they came and there was a few left on the wall the next day. And as the kind of day, the third day, the fourth day, and now when we come in today, you know, you see the whole wall is covered um, from the days before. And what this means for us is that the children are really seeing the space as theirs. Because if the space is yours, you don't want to ruin it and you want to keep it and you're happy to leave your thing there, right? Because it's yours and you're coming back and it's there. And I think when you walk into the shelter, I think there's pictures here, you know, it's this huge open stadium with bed, 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 bed. It's mixed men and women. It's, it's, it's an intimidating scene, I have to say. It's an intimidating scene. It's loud. You see there's absolutely no privacy. Uh, you're very, very exposed. Um, the noise, there's people talking on megaphones. It's a very unsettling place. Uh, but then when you kind of turn the corner and you, you enter our safe space, you can see here, you kind of peek through, um, there's a sense of calm. You know, you walk in. I'm impressed every time I walk in because the children are sitting calmly. They're playing. There's amazing interactions. They're helping clear up. They're setting up. Um, there's really a feeling that this is kind of a, a sanctuary um, where they know that they're safe and there's a kind of a place just to be children um, and kind of escape the craziness of, of outside. Um, so yeah, it's a really, it's a very, very special place. Um, 
Yeah, I think I think you can talk maybe about the COVID uh, issues. Um, sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, we we are definitely trying to make sure that uh, we're protecting uh, uh, the team and the people around us, um, continuing to support it with masks and and anything that uh, we've all been you know part of uh, in the last two years. Um, the communities are not. Um, uh, are not wearing the masks, uh, mainly out of choice. Um, so I think it's another kind of um, message that the government here is trying to work on uh, because there are, they have been cases. Um, there have been already 26 cases in one of the shelters that we're working in. So it's, it's another, another point of, uh, of concern and focus. So, someone asked whether, do, do you know if the, if the refugees are actually vaccinated or not, or it's not something that, is discussed. So, so many of them aren't, and there actually are stations within every shelter to vaccinate the children and the parents and the mothers. Yeah, we understood that before, and again, uh, that you know, it, this is the statistic we were told, so it's worth checking that in the Ukraine before this started, it was around a kind of a 30 to 40 percent vaccination rate. Mm -hmm. um, so that gives you some idea. Yeah. Just to say as ISRA aid for us, obviously the priority of our staff's safety and welfare is always absolutely at the top. Um, so we make sure that, and also we want to make sure that none of our staff inadvertently uh, could, you know, be passing anything. So we make we make sure whether you need it or not that every staff member comes with a, a PCR test before. Uh, we make sure that all of our staff are vaccinated. Um, we try to take all the precautions we can from our side, um, but obviously when, when you walk into such an emergency, um, for, the, for the refugees, COVID is not, you know, the forefront of their mind at the moment. It, it's what's happening, leaving everything, uh, leaving their families and arriving in a kind of a strange place. So we have to kind of see it through that lens as well. Um, even though we have a crisis going on here, we still have a crisis in Afghanistan. We still have uh, disasters in other parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. We had a question from Kay earlier about where else uh, Israel operates, and um, um, if you could just share um, a, a little bit about, you know, what it's like to be in an organization where, you know, you, you have people that are spread to, uh, as Jonathan was describing before, uh, how to make a very quick decision about mobilization and taking on what, as 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 Hagit referred to, maybe you know, months or years of uh, a, a commitment with, uh, um, with what may follow from this. So a lot of people know Israel as an emergency response organization, uh, but actually we also very much focus on long-term development. And for us, often the emergency is kind of our access point um, to a particular context. Um, so we shift very, very quickly from emergency response to kind of have that long-term recovery um, perspective in mind. And that's why Hagit was referring already at the beginning to kind of, this is going to be a long protracted uh, crisis, whatever happens in the Ukraine, because the situation of this many, dis, you know, forcibly displaced people causes, um, you know, huge ramifications across the world and, and here in Moldova specifically. Um, so we very much focus. So currently, we, we also have a very large emergency response team in the Philippines. Uh, there was recently a typhoon at the end of December um, that's caused, you know, absolutely startling devastation across the islands of the Philippines. Um, we have a team working closely with local partners in Ethiopia. And uh, we actually just finished our emergency response mission in Haiti um, following, uh, you know, the climate related disaster there. But as well as our emergencies, we actually have long-term missions uh, in countries around the world, from South Sudan to Vanuatu in the Pacific, to Uganda, to Colombia, dealing with the Venezuelan uh, refugee crisis, to Mozambique. I mean, we're in 12, 12 uh, countries around the world. And in some places, we've been there for years. So in South Sudan, we've been there for over eight years, um, just to give you an idea of you know, the lengths and the times we stay. Um, and for us, part of what we're doing around the world when we when we exit is really to, to really make sure that when we leave, that we build sustainable programs, that we're working with local partners, so that even when we leave, the kind of programs and the, the activities that we're doing and the sort of expertise and everything that relates to that uh, will stay for the long term. 
Well, I should I should tell you that um, you're getting lots of love and appreciation from um, the folks on this call, uh, myself included, um, both as to your professionalism and your 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 calm and your experience in in doing this. Um, obviously, it sort of belies actually the chaos that's around you and that you need to operate in. But again, one of the things that I think one of uh, Israel's great contributions to the world is the ability not only to function in an environment of chaos, but to actually um, uh, really do it in a humane and empathetic way where children and hamsters and, uh, and everyone you know, that's part of this trauma is recognized uh, uh, as a living being that, that is going through this and, and, and it, it is so, um, really inspiring your work. Um, I would like to ask you before we sign off, um, about challenges that you've faced and, uh, obviously each crisis brings its own, each day brings its own surprises. And while you prepare yourself for everything, you're you're going to be thrown lots of um, um, curveballs and and un, 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 unknowing challenges and maybe you could just describe something each that uh, took you by surprise and that you just had to make some kind of a pivot in order to um, adjust your own expectation or your organization's uh, approach to dealing with something. Um, 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 Curious if anything stands out to you in the early days of this crisis. Yes, I think um, every day something else stands out, um, and every day we're cultivating new new protocols based, obviously, on what we've been doing in the last uh, many years, but very kind of specific to the context that we're at. Um, so maybe just to give uh, some examples of things that. Uh, that I'm very worried about uh, when building now the programs, the um, still the emergency response, but also building upon the recovery and the rehabilitation that we're going to see in the upcoming years. Um, so, so the alarming uh, protection uh, situation. So we're now supporting the municipality specific, like, like I said before, and designing the new shelters that are gonna support women and children only. Um, so that's kind of where, where we, we had many concerns and challenges today and how we really create these safe space and make sure that um, specific vulnerable populations get the focus that they need. Um, another very big focus um, that we have now as a team is working with uh, minors that come without uh, families. Um, so unaccompanied minors that are there and how do you really provide the support and this needs a very different kind of uh, very sensitive support for short term and long term to come. Um, and I think one of the exciting things is, is really the, the partnerships that we have here with the authorities and already building on capacity building programs that can provide the immediate response. Um, so, so yeah, every day and it's a it's new challenge. Yeah, I think I would just say to end is that, you know, as you said, Hagi and I have uh, our experience, this is this is our day job, right? We, we, we do emergencies, we work in them, we travel to them. Um, but I think everyone here really f is really feeling it. It's really feeling how desperate this situation is, how overwhelming it is. Every day we hear more stories, we meet more people. This, this is an absolutely tragic situation. And I think that the place that people find themselves in, um, the trauma, the leaving, the weather, the everything that relates to this, um, for some reason is really, really um, affecting all of us here. Um, so in that sense, I just think it's it's a, it's a really challenging situation. And we're, we're very concerned. We're concerned that this is going to be a very protracted and difficult situation. And uh, tomorrow, I'm just going to give you uh, one more question just came in from somebody that we didn't really get into this up front. The difference between ISRA aid as an NGO responding to this crisis versus uh, the government of Israel responding to it. Could you just maybe say a, a few words on that? And you can do it 
also with an eye toward the person is asking whether they could designate support for a particular mission like this uh, in Ukraine. And, and, okay. and so maybe you could just briefly explain that as we're ending here. Sure. Sure. So just, just to clarify, um, Israel is a non-governmental organization. Uh, we we work we have we we do work in partnership with the with the Israeli government when needed and you know around the world. However, we're not funded by the Israeli government. Only you know small kind of very specific programs. Um, so we are uh, so we're very work, very much working uh, around the world as an independent international humanitarian aid agency. Um, on the second point, um, we really, really appreciate everyone's support always, uh, and especially now. Um, and I would say, of course, if you, um, we're happy to share different ways that you can support uh, for us. Uh, financial donations really are the most important at the moment. Um, it really does enable us to mobilize quickly, to send all the professionals we need to make sure we have all the, equip all the equipment from medical to recreational kits for the children, everything that we need. Um, so it really is critical. It really, really does count. Uh, we really thank everyone that has. And of course, anyone that wants to designate it specifically to the Ukraine crisis, to our work in Moldova, uh, you just write in whatever format that you're, you're sending the uh, funds and we will make sure that it stays restricted to this and will very much support this kind of urgent work that our team are doing. And a huge thank you because it, it, it isn't taken for granted and we really do appreciate the support. Okay, Tamar, um... Taziku Mahmad, uh, you're doing an important, incredible work. We're all very proud of you, and and we we so greatly appreciate at the. I, I know it's not the end of the day for you, but but uh, at least in the evening, the early evening for you, uh, being with us, sharing a little bit about this uh, evolving uh, crisis and uh, the the people who it's affecting. We're uh, proud of your service. Uh, um, not just Israel, but to humanity, uh, um, because that's really what your work represents. And it, it gives us great um, nachas to share the story with uh, other people around the world. So uh, be safe. Thanks again for all of our, uh, uh, for anyone that's new watching us, uh, uh, we're back on Sunday uh, with our regular uh, scheduled program uh, about Israel, uh, Israel's solar edge. So if you have an interest in, in green, uh, technologies and Israel's uh, advancing those technologies. We really have an interesting uh, uh, company and, and uh, expert uh, on that topic. So we hope you'll join us Sunday at, at 12. For now, everyone have a safe week. Thanks for joining with us on this special episode with Israel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.